Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap. You may think that's a secure password field, but we've got the tale of some nefarious websites and their fraudulent fonts. Then, some top tips to evaluate the security of your banking institution and some best practices for verbal passwords. Plus, a controversial story about OPSEC, obfuscurity, security, and you. Plus, of course, your fantastic feedback, a rip-roaring roundup, and so much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems, network, and administration podcast. This is episode 344, broadcast live on November 7th, 2017. This episode is brought to you by our three most excellent sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. My name is Wes, and joining us this week is the man with the master plan. Welcome to the show, Dan. Hello, everybody. How are you doing G'day, this week? Wes. Good day. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, the final cable arrived on Friday. Is that right? To complete so, your master setup over here? So I got the vertical screen oh, running. That is beautiful. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I am definitely, definitely envious. <coughs> I need to spend some time investing in getting getting something like that set up for my home office as well. Yeah, um, but to be fair, this is employers I'm employer provided, so it's not. I see. It's not mine, <laughs> but it is. It is but still you, very nice. You do get to use it. I yeah. do. <laughs> Excellent. Anything else new uh, over there in your world? Um, picking up a new laptop on Friday. I think you are getting new laptops every every other week, at least once a month, as long as we've been doing this show. That's yeah, well, I try, and, I try and keep the turnover going. Yeah, right. You don't want to have them too long. You just no. You keep no. cycling. Yeah, get a yep. fresh, pure yep. experience. Spend more time setting them up than using <laughs> them. Yes. There we go. Oh, boy. Well, I don't know about you, Dan, but uh, these days when I'm browsing the web, I'm, you know, we talk about it on the show a lot, and, and I... I feel bolstered knowing all the new security things that browsers are doing to help keep us safe. You know, even yeah. even just verifying that, like when I'm typing my password into into mm-hmm. a login form, that that site is going to actually be using encryption, secure TLS, etc. But according to our top story today, not all sites am I as protected as I think. This <coughs> I'm, I'm, this is nefarious. There are some cowboys out there, I tell you. Oh, cowboys! That's a good one. I like that. Uh, I, I, I've seen some very terrible ideas when it came to security, but this article by Troy Hunt starts off with bypassing browser security warnings with pseudo password fields. Now, it may not be obvious what we're talking about here, but he starts off with a couple of examples and, and you know, you, you, you may want to run a device requiring mains power in, in the center of your inflatable pool. Anyone who's been on the Internet for a while has seen this classic photograph of a, of a power strip floating on two sandals in the middle of an inflatable pool. And then it says, or imagine there's a fire somewhere, but the hydrant is on the other side of the train tracks. And they've put these little ramps so the train can roll over the hose without damaging the hose. It's meant for cars to roll over a hose. It's meant to be across a road, not across <laughs> tracks. Yeah, train so, uh, just a little bit heavier than a car. Yeah, and it won't jump. Uh, so what's happening here is that when you design a web form for entering credentials, uh, there's a there's a certain type of HTML field which indicates that this is a password field, and if if a browser sees that there's a password field on a form, and it is not HTTP HTTPS, it will put up a warning, and and we've covered previously, and we'll go over this about people complaining about this happening because it's indicating that their site is not secure. And they say, no, our site is secure. It's very secure. It's been secure for years. But they're not quite understanding the security implications. Um, And yeah, it's people with, and I know I've been there, people with a little bit of knowledge, assuming that they know that they're doing the right thing. And when someone tries to tell them, no, you're doing the wrong thing, becoming very obstinate and digging in their heels and saying, no, right. this is fine. We've been doing this for years. There's nothing Getting wrong with it. Defensive and yeah. 
Yes, yes. So, so, reading from the article, let's extend that into the digital world, and we'll talk about HTTPS for a bit. You should use it. No, really, if you're not yeah. using H, if you're not HTTPSing all your things, then you're doing it wrong. I'm trying to HTTPS all my things, um, but we'll see how that goes. The browser vendors know this. And they're increasingly holding non-compliant websites to account. Yep. That really ramped up in January, and we covered this, when both Chrome and Firefox started displaying warnings when a login field was served insecurely. Not everyone was happy about it. No. Because, hey, HTTPS is hard, right? <laughs> That's right. You remember the Oil and Gas International. They logged a bug report yes. with Mozilla. Your notice of insecure password and or login automatically appearing on the website, on the login for my website, Oil and Gas International, is not wanted. And it was put there without our permission. Please remove it immediately. <laughs> we have our own security system and has never been breached in more than 15 years. Your notice is causing concern by our subscribers and is detrimental to our business. So it, it didn't appear on their website. It appeared in the browser. It never touched their website. Right. And I think they're not really understanding what's going on. Um, and what Troy says, th this response is hilarious because causing concern by our subscribers and is detrimental to our business is exactly what the browser vendors are setting out to achieve. Um, and they're using this as a as a lever to force organizations to go secure when common sense hasn't put them already. Right. Um, and Troy says, incidentally, I believe their 15-year streak came to an abrupt end as they suddenly started receiving free penetration tests once this bug, quote, was socialized. So he's saying, try this neat trick by Shop Cambridge. That They found this, this way around it. So it, it came to Troy yesterday, who, who was going through shopcambridge.ca. Uh, I've been speaking with the owner about SSL before I invest in becoming a member, but she's been told by the dev of the platform, it's a franchise system operated by uh, shopcity.com, that SSL is more about Google's monopolizing visibility of content and less to do with security. So I'm not sure what the dev is talking about there. So he says he'll come back there, but I want to show uh, the marvel of the magic that's going on here. First, the browser warnings about an insecure login only fire when there is an input type of password. That's an actual um, uh, HTML configuration thing that you can do in the form. It only says password colon, so it's just basically a text field. So it's just an ordinary text box, but they've got some special CSS uh, on it for some visual styling. But once you click into the field, something magical happens. Basically, they change the text class on the field, and the on-click event on the input box itself sets the placeholder to an empty string. So what else does it does? It also changes the font to something called text-security-disk. And that font is nothing more than a single disk per character designed to be a visual representation of the real disk you'd normally see when entering text into a proper password field. So it's sort of faking a password field. It needs this in order to work because otherwise the placeholder would no longer say password. <laughs> right. And instead you'd see eight round disks representing letters of the word password. So password is what is in the field before you click into it. So you click into it, it erases the text that's there, and then it changes the font so that anything you then type comes up as a disk. So he's uh, quoting again, the bottom line is once all of this is tied together, then there's the veneer of a password field. But because it isn't a password field, there's no browser warnings. So that's how they're getting away with it. They're still in HTTP, but they've redesigned their text field to look like a password field. Why they didn't just go HTTPS, I'm not sure. 
And the way they're looking at it, both the JS and the CS have been added in line in the page source as though it's an afterthought. So it looks like a bug fix to me is how I'd interpret this. So the same block of JS and CS is in there twice on line uh, 11,000, uh, uh, sorry, no, 11, one, uh, 1,111, huh. and again on line 1,156. Um, his explanation as to why this happened is that the browser security warnings came out. They started getting messages about it, and they said, oh, how can we fix this? Oh, I know. We'll do this. So the font they're using has been around for at least two and a half years. So it existed before these browser warnings came out. So I don't know why that particular font exists and what it's for. But maybe it's for this particular reason, but not in this particular application. Right. So the design, the the intent of the of the font is not to get around this issue. So this it's ridiculous, he says, and it didn't happen by accident. Someone purposely set out to do this instead of going HTTPS. So <clears throat> they've. The, the same thing happens in Firefox as well as Chrome. And someone logged a bug with Bugs, Bugzilla, with Mo, Mozilla, about Shop Cambridge's CA shaded behavior. But clearly, there's a deeper fundamental understanding of the technology on ShopCity.com's behalf. If you, you can recall, there were they were the ones who were mentioned in the original message I received. So the message about industrial oil and gas, is that the, uh, I may have the name wrong, but it was, oh, scrolling up. Uh, yes, it was Oil and Gas International. Uh, yes. Oil and Gas International were hosted on Shop City. And so this other site is also hosted by Shop City. So he's speculating that Shop City has an issue here. And if they try to load over HTTPS, they get a warning that the certificate that's being presented is for secure.shopcity.com, not for shopcambridge.ca, as you would expect. Uh. So what this tells me is that ShopCity hasn't provided any way for people to do HTTPS. And so because they can't do HTTPS, they're faking it with this browser thing. Now, People may wonder, why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because you're entering your credentials over an HTTP huh. session, which can be easily viewed by anyone along the way. So it's not a secure way to enter credentials. Oh, gosh, That's no. what HTTPS is for. So there's a comment on, on one of Troy's articles here is basically SSL is more about Google monopolizing visibility of content and less to do with security. That That's what we talked about before. Yes. But Troy goes on to say, I've heard this before from what I can only describe as the anti-vaxxers of the technology world. And they include comments like this. Google is, j is just a bully because it is so big. It can go fuck itself. People just don't understand what's going on here. Sorry for the swear words if anyone's too sensitive, but that's what the comment is. Yep. The rationale is that because a site he worked on, going into the quote that this is extracted from, his rationale was, was that he worked on a site that had some shoddy code and a nefarious party managed to modify the site, yet the padlock remained. So he's saying even though it was HTTPS, the site was still hacked. Well, yeah, the two things are different. Right. The security of the website is not the transport layer security. That's what TLS is. Exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. No one's saying the, this the, will fix all of your security problems. It's no. just a piece of the chain here. It just ensures that the communication between my web browser and your website can't be read by someone along the way. Right. What it does once it gets there is up to you. <laughs> yeah. So... Sounds like we shouldn't be going to their servers anyway. It, it I, I'm just very confused <laughs> as, as to why people can can don't yet understand the difference between transport layer security and website security or application security. 
Okay. There's there's more to security than just HTTPS. It's also just frustrating in that, like, yes, Google does have a large amount of a power, perhaps perhaps too much, especially given that mm-hmm. they you know are the major search engine and the major browser in many cases. Uh, but that doesn't mean HTTPS and TLS are not a good thing to do. And and you know you having some problems with it. And sure, you know TLS, the Certificate Authority system, all of that. There's a there's problems in every layer of the stack. But we still need to take the steps that we can that are available to us to try to improve the security, especially if you are having financial transactions or other you know important credentials mm-hmm. being transmitted over mm-hmm. the wire. Hmm. Uh, I can't imagine what would happen if you got into that. Uh, oil and gas website. Yeah, right. Like, what? What are you going to be controlling there? It's a good I mean, question. Mm. <sighs> Reading some of the other comments, it isn't just with the developers implementing this, but also with the coworkers who know more, but don't speak up and say something against it. Surely, someone must have. I've come across this and said, this is wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. It, it, it is hard sometimes to speak up and say, no, this isn't right. Don't do this. It is a job security type thing. Your job isn't going to be very secure if the website gets hacked and you get tossed out on your ass. But <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's a, that's a very good point, right? I mean, it is, I think, I think people are slowly realizing this and obviously the you know the internet had a very open open past it's not the internet we have these days it's not the web we have um and it it seems like slowly especially after you know after the equifax incidents and and other major ones we've covered on this show security has to be a holistic part of your process because at the end of the day like if you become the next equifax that has serious implications to your bottom line and the health of your company and it's all the way through the team. Everyone's got to be thinking about security. I, I, I've seen developers who said, oh, no, this is all just in-house. We don't, we don't need to use SSL for that, do we? Yeah, we do. If, just, just because it's in-house doesn't mean it shouldn't be HTTPS. You don't know who's listening and looking at stuff. If someone was to get in behind the firewall and start listening... They can see everything in the clear, including credentials. Well, if Troy's article has you as incensed as we are, maybe it's time to go start learning about TLS, HTTPS, website security, if you're not already familiar. I can think of no better place than our first sponsor this evening over at DigitalOcean.com. It's a great playground. It's super easy to get started. In less than 50 seconds, you can have a VPS of your very own. Yeah, DigitalOcean.com. We've got a promo code over there. One word. Snap Ocean. That'll get you started with a $10 credit. What can you get for that? Well, there's an easy way to answer that. Head on over to their pricing page. Then here you can see just how clear, simple DigitalOcean really is. That's the thing about it, right? So there's a ton of places to get VPSs on the web. DigitalOcean calls them droplets, which I think is an adorable name. And that's just, that's reason one to use DigitalOcean. But really the reason is it's simple, transparent, pricing. You'll always know what you're going to pay per month. There's no like secret terms or weird scaling charges or anything like that. And just talking in terms of raw resources, your compute, your network, your transit, all that, DigitalOcean has super competitive pricing. It all starts for $5 a month. Yeah, that's right. $5 a month. Super simple, super easy to get started with. For that, you get a whopping 512 megs of memory, one virtual CPU, 20 gigs of an SSD disk and one terabyte of transfer. This isn't your grandfather's transfer. No, no, my friends, not at all. This is 40 gigabit E right to the hypervisor. DigitalOcean has great transit and peering agreements with pretty much all the backbones on the internet. So you can be sure whatever data center you're coming from, you're going to get super fast, great transit. Go spin up whatever OS of your choice. Do some updates. Go do some bandwidth tests. You'll really see what I'm talking about. I use it all the time as a proxy or other situation where I'm just not getting the bandwidth I want to my local facility. Download on DigitalOcean, transfer it later when I've got better bandwidth. Works fantastic. If you need more than that, though, they have hourly pricing. So that's that, it just makes it so clear to get started, right? So maybe maybe you've got like a heavy compute compute job, right? You need you really need some, some CPUs going. You need to be able to store that. You want some memory for your working set. At only t- like 12 cents an hour, you can get 8 gigs of memory, 
four CPUs, 80 gigs of SSD disk, and five terabytes of transfer. The prices are super affordable. Plus, it comes with a whole bunch of extras that you've like come to know and love from other cloud providers, except with the super simple, super easy to use, easy to use DigitalOcean spin stuff like cloud firewalls. You don't have to be a PF or IPFW expert. No IT, IP tables knowledge needed. DigitalOcean has great, simple to use dashboard, simple to use API, helps you get that set up. Plus, let's say you've got two droplets in the same data center. Boom, networking between them, that's free. They've just added object storage. Yeah, that's right. So uh, they've got an S3 compatible API, all backed by super awesome SSD disks. Very easy to use. It's just my it's just my favorite. If you need to transfer files, you just need to temporarily store something. Maybe you're building a new app that has to, you know, wants to put some objects in the cloud. Go check it out. Plus they've got block storage, monitoring, load balancers, you know, everything you might need to build the next startup of your dreams. Don't waste any more time. Use our promo code SNAPOcean to get started and head over to digitalocean.com. And thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. All right, Mr. Dan, what do you got next for us today? The next is something that I've encountered once before and not anywhere else, but I haven't actually thought about asking about it, even though I knew it exists. So doesn't that sound clear and logical? It sure does. It does, doesn't it? So this article is from Krebs on Security. And it's titled, A Simple Banking Tip, Verbal Passwords. So hmm. this isn't a password you type in. This isn't um, a software token that you look up. It's a word that you, you have stored. So it might be a word. It might be a phrase. doesn't matter. The key thing is don't make it something that you can ask for. In other words, not your social insurance number, not your birthday, not your okay. wife's maiden name, not your mo mother's birth date, not something that someone could look up. Mm, but basically, right. you, you make it a word. It's, it's like a safe word, um, like banana, okay. for example. Right. So like not, so, not necessarily a bunch of inherent meaning or relevance to your life, but, right. but something, just a, something that can serve yep. as an identifier. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, hello, sir. I see that you have a passphrase on your account. Could you tell me what it is, please? Okay. Um, Interesting. You make it anything you want. Th this is why I think that security questions, y you know how you have these things, I forgot my password, oh, well, well, we'll reset it for you, but first, answer these questions. And they have a pre-built list of questions, and they're always... Uh, things that they think you'll never forget, like right. your social security number. Your, where did you live when you were 12? What was the address? What was your dog's name? <laughs> All stuff that people could just sort of gather out of you without you really worrying about it. Right, so, that in all other situations, you wouldn't mm -hmm. really treat as sensitive information. Mm -hmm. Now, I've said this before. Make up your own questions. Allow the user to make up their own questions, no matter what they are. And if you don't have a choice of questions, lie. Lie and store the answers that you gave in your password manager, just like you do your passwords. And the reason you do this is make it random characters. M make the answers to the questions the same random jumbly bits of characters that you use for your password. No one's going to guess that or be able to figure it out. Weiss maiden name? string of random characters. Huh. No one's going to be able to get past that. So, back to this. There was a time when I was content to let my bank authenticate me over the phone by asking for some personal identifiers, such as SSN, DOB, that are broadly for sale in the cybercrime underground. At some point, however, I decided this wasn't acceptable for institutions that held significant chunks of our money, and I began taking our business away from those that wouldn't let me add a simple verbal passphrase that needed to be uttered before any account details could be discussed over the phone. So this isn't over the web browser, this isn't in person, this is just over the phone, where you, know, you can't present your ID. And this happens all the time. 
banks call you up and they say, hey, listen, to identify you, you know, which of the following accounts do you have? And they name three or four accounts and you're supposed to pick the one. Um, and is this a joint account or is it held only by yourself? And that's usually a very easy question to get. But I wish they would get more fancy, more like this. Back to the article. Even so, many institutions don't properly train their customer support staff or have high turnover in that department. This can allow clever and insistent crooks to coach customer service reps into validating the call with just the SSN and or date of birth or requiring the correct answers to so-called knowledge-based authentication questions. KBA is what he's calling this. So summarizing the next few paragraphs, he talks about how um, he's previously posted about identity thieves can reliably work around KBA because it involves answering questions about things like previous loans, addresses, co-residents, information that can be gleaned from online sources or social media. Uh, last week, we talked about someone doing physical intrusion testing and how they first looked on social media websites for someone that worked at the uh, client's location and then figured out that they had an interest in a given topic. And so they were their mark when they called in. And when they said, oh, listen, sorry, I can't do that. But, you know, I'm ex I've, got, I've got this common interest of yours. It's not how they put it. but Right. And so they went that way. So social media is a, is, is a big um, inroad. So there, don't have your social media world readable. Have it semi-private, just your friends or something like that. You can't do that on Twitter very easily. But That's true. Just be careful what you're putting out. Now, quoting again on what Krebs is saying, ultimately, I ended up moving our investments to an institution that consistently adhered to my requirements, namely that failing to provide the passphrase required an in-person visit to a bank branch to continue the transaction, at which time ID would be requested. That's normally what happens when you show up in the bank. Their customer service folks consistently asked the right questions and weren't interested in being helpful otherwise. I'm not going to name the institution uh -huh. for obvious reasons because he's getting good service. Otherwise, he winds up, you know, oh, you're promoting these guys. <laughs> right. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you. I'm, he, you. Are you not sure that your financial institution supports verbal passwords? Ask them. If they agree to set one up for you, take a moment or two of the next few days to call in and see if you can get the customer service folks at that institution to talk about your account without hearing that password. Yeah, that's a great idea. And if they, if, if they get by it, it's time to change. And then there's a little bit here about trading security for inconvenience. Right. And, well, I said inconvenience, <laughs> but convenience. Um, Lack of security is a big inconvenience. Um, now, someone says here, verbal passwords should not be confused with voice biometrics, a technology some financial institutions are now adopting that can help authenticate customers while profiling and blocking fraudsters who repeatedly call into customer service representatives. Even if your institution offers voice biometrics Adding a verbal password or passphrase is still a good idea. Have you encountered this anywhere no, at all? No, I haven't. But uh, I mostly do my banking online uh, without without ever using the phone or going into an actual branch. So I may not be the best testing set here. I know one institution has it. And I remember what, what the passphrase is, but I don't remember what the institution huh. is. Come on, Dan. Come on. Uh, well, I have a feeling it was it, it's an overseas institution. It's not I see. Canada or, or the U.S. It's something overseas. And I, I do remember them asking me, but it's been a number of years, so it must be a New Zealand institution. Yeah. Um, now, there is an interesting bit here. Let me try and find it. Um, 
they're talking about high profile. Mm. You know, this seems like a technique that could be applied to all kinds of, not just banking institutions, but I'm thinking about like, you know, maybe your local utilities or other kinds of services where it makes sense that you should be mm-hmm. able to go appear in person if you absolutely need to, where that's yep. like, yes, it's inconvenient, but it's it's a lot better than, you know, having your service shut off mm-hmm. uh, by someone who doesn't mm-hmm. like you or, or whatever, all the different situations that can exactly. happen when you don't have good security. Um. I found that it's very easy to get water and electricity turned on. Very easy. Just walk in, say, I'm doing this, pay for it. Bang, it's on. They don't care. (laughs) It's much harder to get it turned off. That's good. The opt-in ultra-secure mode is intended for truly high-risk users, including those who face the threat of state-sponsored, highly-resourced Cyber espionage, writes Andy Greenberg for Wired. Think politicians and officials, high net worth individuals, activists, dissidents, and journalists. Now, he's actually he's not talking about banks here. He's talking about something else. It, going back, it's a night. While a great many people are willing to trade security for more convenience, it's nice when those of us who are paranoid can opt in for more security. A great recent example of this is Google's optional advanced protection feature, which makes it much harder for password thieves to hack into your Gmail uh, drive or other Google properties, even if the attackers already know their passwords. So this option... It's a special USB key, uh, Yogi, Yugi. I forget the name, the brand name of some of them, but that, that, that's what it is. It's basically something that's plugged into your laptop. Um, where do they go? If you forget your password or lose your hardware login keys, you have to jump through more hoops than ever to regain access. The better to foil any intruders who would abuse that process to circumvent all of Google's other safeguards. So, yeah, all non-Google services and apps will be exiled from reaching into your Gmail or Google Drive. Logging in from a desktop will require a special USB key, while accessing your data from a mobile device will similarly require... Sorry, I don't know that. (laughs) Yeah, that's what happens. Now... What do you think of this, um, you know, higher risk opt-in sort of thing? Is it a good compromise between, you know, not not making everyone jump through these hoops, but allowing options for people who either just, you know, are paranoid or reasonably suspicious about their own security or are, you know, at legitimate higher risk? I'm I'm okay with the hardware key. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how inconvenient it would be if I forget my key at home. If it was something in my phone, I, I know what they're talking about is actually a physical key. Right. But I don't, I'm not sure how much more secure this is than a, than the six digit token generated by Google Auth mm-hmm. apps. I, I don't know how much more secure this would be because that is still pretty secure. It's hard to guess a six digit number i'd be interested to know if i could uh you know if you could enroll your own or, or figure out a way where you know obviously they ship you this this key or you you sign up for it but it'd be nice to be able to tie it into to other systems if you maybe have a, an existing security mm-hmm. infrastructure set up um, but still um, it seems like a nice option if you are someone who's you know high risk i i know that bank of new zealand sends you a small laminated card or did and it has uh, a table on it. And so numbers across the top, numbers down the side, and it sends you two of those numbers. So you pick row and column oh, and reply with the number that's on that card. Yeah. So these can, these can be one-time cards unique to you. Totally. Oh, that's a good system. I like that. Yeah. And then as long as they are the only ones, you know, they keep the their, their be able, ability to matching set on, on their yep. side secure, then yeah. Okay. Yep. Interesting. So, yeah, that that I like. I do like I that. That one's that like kind of low tech too. You know, it might be yes. easy for a, lo- a yes. wide range of consumers to use, even if you're not yeah. technically savvy. If you don't carry the card with with you, carry a photograph of the card. Yeah. Just be careful. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go posting that <laughs> <up> <laughs> yeah, right, accidentally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Oh, auto upload everything to Facebook. There we go. Oops. Perfect. Uh, all right. Well, anything else you would like to uh, like to recommend that we how we, how do we secure our better lives here? Yeah, I'm gonna ask my my bank if if they do this. Yeah, all of my. I think there's some very practical advice in here, and it, it is it's just like simple steps like these are exactly what we need so that we can have you know incremental security, more security just in our day to day lives at, at all the institutions that we use instead of you know I, the the number of bank institutions that I've wanted to work with or you know it would have been convenient to do business with, but where they had those artificial password limits where it has to be between six and eight characters and it can only contain you know alphanumeric or you know just like just letters and maybe a number, insane, insane. It's nice to see that there are at least some institutions that are, you know, jumping on the advanced, better security bandwagon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And do you, do you have a? They're talking about a YubiKey. Oh yeah, I have a YubiKey. That's what the, that's that's what this is all about. This third-party dongle that you're plugging in. It's like a YubiKey. Do you use them? Yeah, uh, I do. I do actually need to. I just got a new one. I need to. Uh, set it up kind of kind of redo things uh but yeah they're they're pretty handy as a you know you can use them for gpg you can use them uh through that uh, as an ssh key if you'd like uh plus Mm -hmm. there's a fido support and universal two second factor uh they have their own one-time password implementation there's a lot going on there uh there are some qualms at least with yubikey yubico in particular about the their firmware is no longer open um but there are various other vendors, some some instructions for making your own or, you know, buying parts and be able to assemble them yourself. So there's a lot of options in the, the hardware key space. So at one time they're like all open source? I don't know about all, but the, some of the like the firmware and the manufacturing details were more open than they are. I don't know the exact details. We'll have to I'll have to look into that again so we can provide an update. Um, continuing my support for technology in New Zealand, someone in the <laughs> comments says, this is standard for all customers for the ASB bank in New Zealand. No opt out. ASB, if I recall correctly, is the Auckland Savings Bank. Okay. Wow. Hey, New Zealand sounds like the place to be. It does. It does. Well, all right. Well, uh, <laughs> anything else you want to take away from this article? Mm, I think it's a good step. Let's see what other people know about it. Yeah, definitely. I I completely agree. You know what? And I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's someone are, that that agrees with us as well. And that would be our next sponsor, which is Ting. Head on over to techsnap.ting.com. The average Ting bill it's just twenty three dollars per phone per month, and that's what makes it a smarter way to do mobile. You almost certainly need a mobile phone, but that doesn't mean that you have to compromise your security. One of the things I love about Ting is they've got a great bring your own device program. So if you've selected a phone for you, either GSM or CDMA, and you're, you know, you're more comfortable with the security of that, be that the latest iOS device, be that uh, an, an Android phone that you've you know, audited, maybe it's one of the latest Pixel devices straight from Google, so you know it's getting, uh, getting updates, maybe it's from a third-party vendor that you trust more so and doesn't run the Google Play firmware, whatever you're doing, there's a great chance it's going to work on Ting. And so instead of having to sign up for a contract, having to figure out how much data you're going to use, see if they're really going to like even allow you to bring this device onto their network instead of trying to force you to buy one at some weird discount that you then end up paying over your two-year contract, you have to go to a physical store, none of that. Go to their BYOD page. You can enter in the IMEI of your device. Go check to see if it'll work. They support both GSM and CDMA, so there's a great chance it will. Then, once you're you know already kind of half convinced, head on over to their rates page and you'll really see what we're talking about here for starters each line starts at just six dollars a month you don't have to make a giant commitment you don't have to sign up for a crazy contract you just pay six dollars a month per line yeah they're okay there's a couple taxes and some fees and stuff but that'll vary by your area team can't do anything about that talk to your municipality after that it's just pay for what you use if you don't use it at all six dollars a month which all right, don't throw away money, but still, the $6 a month, you could lose that in the couch. That's how little it is. Then, come over to the prices page, the rates page, and you can get a great estimate of how much you're actually going to spend. So maybe you use a bunch of minutes, you're, you know, you're a big talker, 500 minutes for just 9 bucks. Maybe you don't use any text messages because why would you? No usage. 
And then there's data, right? You just pay for your data. Now, this data, it's a little bit different than other, other places because it's super simple. It's just data. You pay for what you use. You don't, there's no crazy overage charges. You don't have to pre-define what kind of bucket you're going to need. Oh, I really need that five gigs or I need this fake unlimited amount where you're going to get mysteriously slowed down after some number that they won't tell you. No, not a ding. Not at all. Just pay for what you use. They're not going to throttle you. Be reasonable. They're reasonable. That's what makes it so easy. Uh, maybe you just need 500 meg because you're on Wi-Fi all the time. But I know I am. I've got it on the car. I've got it in the bus. I've got it at work and at home. In this case, your monthly bill would just be $25 a month. And guess what? Guess what, everyone? We have got a special deal for you. So go to techsnap.ting.com. You're going to get a $25 service credit. So that'll get started. It's almost certainly going to pay for your whole first month's bill. Maybe not if you add a whole bunch of lines, but that that just means you're saving more money because they're just $6 a month. It's just pay for what you use. It's great if you want to have a, you know, a backdoor uh, access to your home when your main service provider goes out, like we saw this, this uh, you know, yesterday with those Comcast outages. Ting is great in that situation. Maybe you have a nanny for your child and you want to make sure that they have a device you can always reach them with. Another great usage for Ting. Or you go on camp and you just want to have a backup phone that you keep in the truck you know is there when you need it in case your own phone you know, dies, loses, breaks, you drop it in the water, whatever. Ting is perfect for all those use cases and they make a great main service provider. So go check them out. They support CDMA, GSM. They're super simple. They've got all the features you want, three-way calling, tethering, voicemail, pretty much everything you've come to expect. And they've got an incredible dashboard, really the best dashboard. They've got a great app and fantastic customer service waiting to help you. So go give them a call. Go check out their website. Head on over to techsnap.ting.com. And thank you very much to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Okay, we've got one more story in today's main segment. What is it? Mm-hmm. This is going to be controversial. Yes, it I will. Hope. I hope. Um, I agree with the premise of the article because I practice what they're advocating, and I'll I, I'll explain how I practice it. <clears throat> Pardon. The title of the article is "Obscurity is a Valid Security Layer." Most of us are familiar with a concept known as security by obscurity. The term has negative connotations within the InfoSec community, not just the InfoSec community. There's lots of people outside the InfoSec community that use yeah. and know this term, usually for the wrong reason. There's little debate about whether security by obscurity is bad, but the this is true because it means the secret being hidden is the key to the entire system's security. So that's not what we're talking about. So there's good obscurity versus bad obscurity is what the article goes on about. The key determination for whether obscurity is good or bad reduces to whether it's being used as a layer on top of good security or as a replacement for it. The former is good, the latter is bad. In summary, security in depth. So if your only security is you're using Telnet, but it's on a different port, and you think that's okay, well, no, it's not, because there's no encryption in Telnet, and they're likely to find the other port. Now, an example of security by obscurity is when someone has an expensive house outfitted with the latest lock system, but the way you open the lock is simply by jiggling the handle. So if you don't know how to do that, it's pretty secure. But once you know, it's trivial to bypass. And once you know, you can tell anyone, and anyone can bypass it. So that's obscure. Sorry, that is uh, security by obscurity. So I know, I'm this, is a, a, hard this is a tongue twister, that's for sure. That That is security by obscurity. If the secret ever gets out, it's game over. Right. The concept comes from cryptography, where it's utter, utterly sacrilegious to base the security of a cryptographic system on the secrecy of the algorithm. Now, I'm guilty there. I've I've encrypted keys with some made-up thing. But it's just the key to unlock the software. Mm, okay, I see what you're saying. So you have to supply the key, 
and it'll go through some sort of algorithm to figure out whether or not it's a valid key. And that key is created somehow from the user's details. So go and find out how I did that if you want. Huh. Now, <clears throat> a powerful example of where obscurity is used to improve security is camouflage. Consider an armored tank such as the M1. They're pretty good. The tank is equipped with some of the most advanced armor ever created and has been shown repeatedly to be effective in actual real-world world battle. So, given this highly effective armor, would the danger to the tank somehow increase if it was printed the same color as its surroundings? Or how about when in the future, when we think, uh, sorry, or how about in the future when we can make the tank completely invisible? Do we decrease the effectiveness of the armor? No. Making something harder to see does not make it easier to attack if or when it is discovered. And that's a fallacy that has to end. So just because you've hidden something doesn't make it easier to attack it once it's found. That's where the security and depth comes. Right. So we're getting, slowly getting to the example that I do and still do, and I do this all the time. Okay. So he starts talking about OPSEC, which is operational security, um, which involves protecting information that can be used by an enemy. Like, for example, what you're doing or where you're going. And here's a few examples. There are usually one or two, one or more decoy limousines and helicopters flying next to where the president is. And the reason for this is so that the enemy is not sure which one to attack. There's actually three helicopters that take off, aren't there? I, I, I think that's three yeah, think or two. So. Two or three, yeah, I'm not sure. When you do executive protection or military maneuvers, you generally want to keep your movement plans as private as possible to avoid giving the enemy an advantage. Keep it secret. People are encouraged to take random routes to and from locations that are unsafe so that potential attackers don't know exactly where to attack you. All of the above are about controlling and restricting information, or put another word way, obscuring it. And if it was such a bad practice, it wouldn't be practiced every day by the militaries of the world. Now, I realize this guy is just trying to justify his point about obscurity is not a bad thing. Right. But he has valid points. But don't use that as an excuse. Now, we're, we're getting down to the SSH example, which is what I use. Right. I mean, I think in your last one, right, it's not that they are, you know, you sure you want to make it difficult for your enemies to find you, but that doesn't mean that you're going to sit there unprotected with no weapons, just assuming that they won't find you. Yes. Just make it less likely that they will. Yeah. So this guy configured his SSH, SSH daemon to listen on port 24 in addition to port 22. He just wanted to see the difference in attempts to connect. The connections are usually password guessing attempts, is what he says. His expected result is far fewer attempts to access SSH on port 24 than port 22, which makes sense, which I equate to less risk to my or any SSH daemon. I ran with this alternative port configuration for a single weekend and received over 18,000 connections to port 22 and five to port 24. That's 18,000 to five. So basically, he's saying that your risk goes down by not being there. So if you're not on port 22 and nobody can listen, can a try on port 22, your risk goes down. And I agree with that. Once port 22 is found, you're wide open. But there's going to be 18,000 to 5. That's the difference. Now... They're talking about another way to look at this is through risk, which can be calculated as risk equals probability times impact. I hate the use of that word impact. Effect, I think, is what he's trying to say. Right. So I do have SSH tightly filtered. You cannot get to port 22 on most of my servers from most of the world. Only a very few select places can you get to port 22. Awesome. Now, 
you can argue that that is security through obscurity because I'm obscuring the fact that I have something running on port 22. But most people will say, well, no, that's not through obscurity. You're, you're blocking that from everyone. Well, what's the difference between blocking it and putting it on another, another port? People will say, well, you're no less vulnerable there. Well, no, you're not less vulnerable, but you're certainly going to get l less people knocking on that other obscure port. And that's why I do it. So I have less to review in the logs. If I have 18,000 attempts in the logs, I can't review all of them. <laughs> yeah, right. There's that, no way I'm going difficult. to review all of them. I'm going to look through the successful attempts to find out what's going on. Um, so I tightly filter it so no one can get there anywhere. Right. Anyway, and then I have SSH listening on another port for SSH public keys only. That's all it allows. Now, yeah. someone may say, well, you should have that on port 22 as well, allowing only SSH keys. Well, it's there too as well. What I'm saying is that sometimes I need to get to point A when I'm not at point B, C, or D, which is not filtered. So I put SSH on another port, which can be accessed. Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So that, yeah, so you can get to 24 or whatever, uh, yeah. but that one is more secu more locked down in that it only allows you to, to sign in with your key. Yes, and port 22 is that way as well. It's just that I've got, usually I log in through port 22 from all these other locations, just SSH to this host. I see. But if I'm in another lo location, I go in through this other port. And yeah, yeah you can actually do all of that through um, dot ssh slash config yeah you can definitely. say any anytime anytime you connect to this host use this port and use this user id things like that you can you can get very specific yeah it makes say, it very convenient it, use this protocol use that do agent forwarding don't do agent forwarding yeah so I'm hoping this will provoke a lot of <laughs> response. So let's go through the guy's summary. Yeah. Security through obscurity is bad because it substitutes real security for secrecy in such a way that if someone learns the trick, they compromise the system. Obscurity can be extremely valuable when added to actual security as an additional way to lower the chances of a successful attack. The key question to ask is whether you're better served by adding additional uh, impact reduction, armor, locks, etc., or if you're better off by adding more probability reduction, i.e., hiding, obscuring, etc. Most be, and this is the one that I think will cause us. Uh, this will offend some people. Most people who instinctively go to obscurity is bad are simply regurgitating something they heard a long time ago and think makes them sound smart. Now, I've, I, I've seen people shout out this obscurity by secure, uh, obscurity, security by obscurity is bad, especially when it comes to changing port numbers for various things. But I disagree with them. I think putting SSH on another port is a good idea. I see no downside to that, none whatsoever. You are not more exposed by doing it. And so long as you've, you've done the proper bit of securing the host and SSH, you're fine. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, I, the, the author's certainly right that, uh, you know, a lot of times this advice does get regurgitated and it... I think it depends on your your audience as well, right? Like you don't, we don't want people to think that this obscurity is something that they can rely on uh, without having proper security underneath. 
Uh, but but to experienced admins, people who know what they're doing, it's true that you know adding a layer of obscurity, it's 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 not likely to to increase your risk. It will probably re- reduce your risk, as we as we've just talked about. So it's also you know it depends a lot on on your threat model as well. So if someone's targeting you, all right, well it's pretty easy to just port scan you and find where SSH is listening. But as he talks about, I'm sure we've all seen, you do get a lot less random scanner attacks if you don't have it just running on the default port. So as long as you are still doing security properly, you understand what your risks are, what you're trying to mitigate, then yeah, I think this article has some great advice. We'll, we'll see what sort of feedback we get here. I'm excited, yeah, definitely. All right, well, um, if you want to sound smart, because I know I do, certainly after after the comments here in this article, I can think of one great way to get started, and that's having some incredible hardware. Head on over to our final sponsor this evening, which is IX systems ixsystems.com slash techsnap there they've got an incredible white paper explaining all the ways that you know just just the the reasons that it makes sense and the things that you need to consider when you're trying to buy hardware for open source software really really this guide is good for you know just buying hardware in general ix systems has been in the biz for a long time they really know what they're doing and even if you don't end up being a customer of ix systems check out the white paper because it's really worth reading and understanding just like what are the trade-offs, the cost-benefit analysis I need to make, what do I need to understand here? And I think they make a great case why they are really the vendor of choice in this area. iXsystems.com slash TechSnap. Then make sure you head on over to their main page because they've got a ton of things. You can really see all the people they've worked with to provide incredible storage solutions. Hardware, storage, the whole gamut. They partner with people like Intel and their incredible Intel processors to build some of the best systems you're ever likely to see. If you don't believe me, just click on over to their blog where I've got all kinds of great social media presence. So they were just at the OpenZFS Developer Summit. They've got their 2017 report. Uh, Michael Dexter, who you've probably heard of if you've watched this show or our our companion uh, BSD Now, he's got a good perspective there. Plus, they've always got these server envy posts I don't miss a single one because they're beautiful. The, the hardware iX makes, especially for some of their big customers, you know, people like Splunk, people like Adobe, people like the University of California Berkeley, serious people with serious data needs. iX understands it, and iX is a great partner for them. How do you get started? Well, you can go to iXsystems.com slash TechSnap, or you can give them a call, and there you will start to experience the iX difference because you'll talk to a real, super talented, very knowledgeable sales engineer. You're going to get white glove service. They're going to walk through, understand what problem you're trying to tackle. Maybe you just need some, you know, some new hardware to make sure your home office has the backups that are needed for tax reasons, legal reasons for your business. Great. Maybe you're building a new data center and you want to make sure that your SAN is top of the line, that you've got all the redundant secure storage that you're going to need for the next 10 years. Great, too. That's the thing. Whatever the scale that you're going for, IX has surely seen it before. From gigabytes all the way up to petabytes, iX can do it. Don't believe me? Go check out their storage page. Start with the free NAS Mini. That's that's more than enough for me, uh, you know, for my personal use, for my business use. They've got the Mini and the Mini XL. Very robust, beautifully designed hardware. You can pick it up just from Amazon Prime. If, it, if that looks great to you, you don't need to customize it. Boom. Simple, fast, easy. Or hit configure and buy on the iX website, and you can go customize one, get it straight from iX. You can also, of course, call them, and they'll, they'll tell you all about why the FreeNAS Mini is incredible. Sure, you can build your own FreeNAS. FreeNAS is open source. iX does a lot of great work there. But when you check out this hardware, go look at some of their, their gallery, look at the pictures, look at their video. you really see what I'm talking about. They've done a lot of engineering to make this redundant, to make it really well designed. Plus, when iX ships it to you, that white glove service really comes through. You're going to get it burn in tested. They're going to make sure all the hard drives are working just as they should and that they're ready to be in production for years. So maybe you're buying a new server and you've had bad experiences with other vendors where it shows up late. It isn't configured at all. You have to ship it to you so that you can configure it. Then you have to go ship it again to the actual data center where then finally a tech racks it in, gets it set up, and you've got your server. Not so at iX. You can get them to configure it for you. They are experts. They'll they'll do it 100% correctly. Then they'll ship it right to the data center. Gets racked up, and it's in production. So don't waste any more time. Don't hassle with big name vendors who are just going to treat you like one small fry. Go to iXsystems.com. Get that real white glove service. 
you'll really be glad that you did. And thank you to iX Systems for, you know, providing us storage and also for sponsoring the TechSnap program. And now it's time for the feedback. Yeah, that's right. It's my favorite segment on the show where we get to hear from you, our dear audience. First up today, we've got a letter from Jonathan. He's writing to us about Kaspersky and that pesky 7-zip file we talked about. All right. So Jonathan writes, I certainly have no idea whether Kaspersky's story as to why they have NSA documents is valid or not. And I agree that a 7-zip file by itself isn't going to be particularly malicious. However, a 7-zip file could hold a payload for malicious software, or it could contain a malicious exe file, or even be an exe file that was renamed in an attempt to disguise it. You could even have a 7-zip file containing only documents, but where the documents are written to be read by a malicious program as instructions. In none of these scenarios is the 7-zip file directly runnable as a malicious program, but it could be used in conjunction with something else to then be malicious. So I don't think that it's out of the question that antivirus software could consider a 7-zip file to be potentially malicious and worth examining, especially when malware authors are doing whatever they can to hide their malware from software that detects malware. Your thoughts, Dan? I couldn't figure out why Kaspersky would have downloaded it unless they scanned what was in it and determined that it was risky. I just don't know. It was, but it was just documents. They might have found keywords in the documents or something that made it think that it was suspicious, like some sort of fingerprint, but I don't know. It seems to be a plausible explanation. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. I think there are, you know, there are a lot of scenarios. We don't know the details of what was contained in that file. It's kind of a, you know, they said or they said sort of issue about like what what's really in those documents? What was there? Why would it have been flagged? I do think we've mm-hmm. seen a lot of, you know, a lot of security or a lot of um, scanning of in particular zip files, not necessarily 7-zip, but zip files, archives uh, that are commonly used to, you know, just wrap around something and then transport it. But assuming that what the NSA is saying about what this zip file actually contained is accurate, I I kind of agree with you. Uh, That said, it may be that the software has some limitations around seven zip files in particular or other, you know, compressed archives Mm -hmm. where it's, you know, maybe it errs on the side of being overzealous and maybe this should not have been flagged, but ended up being so. I don't know. There's a lot of unknowns in this case and that makes it especially tricky to analyze. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for your for writing in. Uh, if anyone else agrees, disagrees, wants to chime in on that thread, please do. Okay, we've got one more piece of feedback today, uh, and that is from our friend Lacey. She's writing to us about containers, jails, and zones. <laughs> Hiya, Dan and Wes. Hi there. Thank you both for a great show. There's always something interesting that you two are discussing, which is fantastic. Hey, we think so too, and it's sure a lot of fun. Thank you and everyone else for watching. Last week, there were some questions about containers and jails. So here are some good resources for differences between containers, zones, VMs, and jails, and a bit of what people are trying to solve. This might be a good starting point for a deep dive each of you were talking about. So that she's, she's got some great links here, um, some YouTube videos, papers. Mm-hmm. We love zones and jails. That's a that's a great talk I've, I've seen before. Really a great collection of links, and I think, uh, I think we may just be pilfering from this list here in the future. Yeah, I think we should do a containers and jails deep dive. Yeah, there's a lot. I can, there's a lot going on. I, I I can talk about what jails can do, and you can talk about containers c- can do. But ho- hopefully, you'll be able to say, "Hey, listen, c- containers do this, and this is the problem they're trying to solve." And I'll be able to say, "Oh yeah, jails do that too." <laughs> uh, this should be a lot of fun, I think. I think so. So, yeah, everyone can get started if they'd like to. Uh, go take a look at the links Lacey's provided because they're really um, really top-notch there. Um, we'll, be, we'll be perusing that list as well, trying to assemble a good list and expect a deep dive coming up in the future. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And thank you to everyone for writing into us. Uh, if you'd like to provide some feedback, that's really one of the most exciting aspects of this show. And it's a great way for us to feel engaged with you, you to be engaged with us. And it really creates keeps the whole thing going. There's a, lots of good ways to get in touch. TechSnap.reddit.com. Uh, you can come 
find us on Twitter. We're both on there. Or jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact is probably the most straightforward. Go choose TechSnap from the drop-down list. That'll get you started. Send us a letter, and uh, you may just see it right here on the program. And now it's time for, sadly, but true, the final segment of today's show. That's right, it's the Roundup. These weren't quite main segment material, but they're still great stories, so uh, let's quickly go through them right now. First up, Crunchyroll.com update at 3.30 a.m. This morning, malicious individuals gained access and altered our Cloudflare configuration. Okay, well, that, just to start... That sounds like it could be pretty dangerous. Uh, you know, Cloud4 controls yeah. a lot of the edge for a lot of websites, so mm-hmm. that has some wide-ranging implications. What happened here? So it was only their Cloudflare configuration. Okay. It wasn't everyone's Cloudflare. So uh, I'm not. They don't actually say how this happened. They don't go into any details. But basically, what they did is. Um, when you went to their websites, it would tell you, hey, listen, uh, try and download this this file, please, crunchyviewer.exe. So you're going to crunchyroll.com, and they sort of say, hey, listen, you're going to have to install Crunchy Viewer in order to proceed. And they were targeting Windows uh, PC web users. Uh, so basically, for about two and a half hours, they had this situation going on. And they finally re-secured the website uh, at about 9, 9 a.m. Um, and everything was back online six hours later. So they say that they, uh, they identified it as an isolated attack on our cloud layer and not Crunchyroll itself. So it was just Cloudflare. It must have just been their Cloudflare because I haven't heard anything about anywhere else. Um, so they're their servers weren't compromised, just their Cloudflare layer, which redirected it, I'm sure, to someone else's server. And, yeah, unless they tell us more about what happened, we have no idea. We have no idea. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, let's move right along then. Some good news, I would say. The New York Times is now available as a Tor Onion service. Yeah, last week we talked about what are some valid uses of the of the dark web? And this is one of them. You can use a t- Tor Onion service to read most of the websites that you want. Why would you do that? Because you don't want your ISP knowing what you're reading. Or you don't want your roommates to know what you're reading if you're on an open network or something like that. Or indeed, wherever you are, at a hotel or something, and you don't want everyone to know that your, your f- favorite news site is the New York Times. You can get to them through this um, Tor service. So yeah, the Tor service, sorry, the dark web isn't just for nefarious things. This is a perfectly legitimate thing to be reading on the dark web. Yeah, definitely. And it's important that uh, you know we're able to access news in a secure and anonymous or as anonymous as possible way to, you know, to have free societies that, that can exist in this world. So I think that's just great. Uh, go check out their article. This it's, it's linked in the show notes. They've got their tour address in there. Uh, yeah. If you use it, if it's valuable, or you uh, have some other good suggestions for us about legal or otherwise things that you should do on the dark net that are not nefarious, do let us know. Well, they say knowledge is power, and you shouldn't be restricting access to knowledge. And you should be able to get read anything you want from anywhere you want. There shouldn't be any of this filtering. Sorry, what I'm getting at <laughs> is if you want to read the New York Times, nobody should have to know that you're reading the New York Times. Absolutely. That's what I'm getting at. I completely agree. And it seems so do they. Okay, so here, uh, here's maybe a security by obscurity fail. Mm-hmm. USB stick with Heathrow security and Queen's data found on a London street. Oh, yikes. Wow. It was about two and a half gig of classified but unencrypted data. 74 files, um, 176 documents, which included maps, photographs, and video files. It is highly confidential as it contains details about security measures adopted by the security at Heathrow for ensuring the protection of high-profile personalities, including the Queen, foreign VIPs, and cabinet ministers. Uh, 
contains data related to CCT camera locations, various types of IDs used for prohibited areas, stuff like that. It's that doesn't why sound was good. this on a USB key? Why was it on a USB key? Who's doing this? This right. is ridiculous. That's crazy. And let alone and unencrypted as well. Unencrypted. Boy. Um, Hopefully there was some policy that was violated here. And if not, that needs to be enacted. Hopefully it can be tracked back as to whose documents these were. Yeah, like definitely. Who who created this? Was it anyway. Heathrow? Was it some vendor in between here? Mm-hmm. What, what's going on? Yeah. Um, they talk about the protection of high profile personalities. Have you ever looked at a video on how they escort high profile personalities through the streets of London? No, I have not. Um, I think it's the city police. The city of London police have a specialized um, uh, motorcycle escort. And they do not close down the the streets for this. Basically, the motorcycles go on ahead, block the intersection, wait until you get there, and through you go. The goal is that the transport never stops. The police keep shutting down the intersections to let you go through, and it's rolling. Once you go past the cop that's stopping your intersection, he gets back on his bike, goes up to the next intersection. there's There's a number of YouTube videos about this, and it's very interesting to see it happen. Side side issue, sorry. Interesting. No, I like it. Okay, well, let's move right along over to Threat Post, where we're learning that Google is ditching public key pinning in Chrome. Yeah, now, I've read a little bit about this, and I have not used it. But basically, they're deprecating the browser support for HTTP public key pinning. Instead, it will adopt the safer, more flexible solution of expect CT headers. Now... I've not used any of this. I've thought about playing around with um, oh, once you go HTTPS, you never go back. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know what uh, feature that, HSTS. that's called. Okay, thank you. And I've thought about doing that. Um, my website already does try to always force you over to HTTPS, but I'm not sure if that's going to break other things on fresh ports. I'm not sure if that's going to break scripts that are non-HTTPS capable. Well, it's time for you to go HTTPS. I'm thinking of making fresh ports only HTTPS, but we'll see. So, yeah, I guess there's been some problems with uh, public key pinning. Didn't we notice, didn't we mention something about that, that if you lose your public keys or somehow you mess it up, Basically, you've blocked the site for... Right. Yes. You, you know, you've said, trust these keys. If you've then lost access to those keys, then you, you, know, you can no longer control, control the website. So as they say here, You're you know, stuck. Google You're argues stuck. that while public key pinning defends against certificate misissuance, it runs the risk of leaving website admins open to difficulties, selecting a reliable set of keys to pin to. Um, they also said that adoption was low, citing that out of the Alexa top 1 million sites, a paltry 375 were using a variant of HBKP. Um, I saw some interesting discussion of this where, you know, some of the researchers involved with, you know, pointing out some of the flaws or issues or potential issues with this system, um, you know, chiming in saying, you know, hey, this isn't, we didn't necessarily want you to walk it all the way back. We just want people to be aware. And also that maybe like a lot of those 375 sites are some of the bigger ones, right? So like if Facebook.com wants to use this system, they have enough admin, yeah. they, they have enough process, money, all of that to, to have secure keys they can take care of. So I'm not sure really where I fall on this. Um, I do, I can see some of the risks that they're talking about, but if it is a system that you can opt into where people can I actually understand those risks, then maybe it's yeah. worth keeping, but uh, I guess not. And the other vulnerability they were trying to uh, avoid is if someone broke into your site, they changed the, the keys, then hold you to ransom until you give them, until you pay and uh, get the keys back. Um, that would not be good either, but that assumes you've first been violated and it, uh, someone's been able to get in. Yeah, right. Exactly. But still, it's no better. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move right along. This is the roundup. After all, now we're back over uh, discussing Cloudflare at uh, Cloudflare's blog. They've got a guide here. Performing and preventing SSL stripping, a plain English primer. Yes. 
You've heard about the crack attack. You should come in here and read this all through slowly. I have not had time to do this, but I plan to do that as late night reading tonight. Ooh. I'm sure it'll help me go to sleep. Um, but basically, it's a way of, of dropping from one security level to another um, so low that there is no security. Um, yeah. It's really it's, it's well it's well written. There's some good diagrams, some good code samples in there. So I think it should be an enjoyable read for everyone, yourself included. Yes, and they actually mention the HSTS, which I'm playing around with, but not sure I'm going to do. So someone said, once you go HSTS, you've got to do all your domains that way because your brother expects all of them. Oh. So if I make freshports.org, all of freshports.org has, has to, to be, be like that. I see, like dev. Dub, 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 beta, all of them. I, have all the to subdomains be. are included in that, right? Yeah. I so, see. Yeah, definitely some considerations, but uh, I look forward to hearing some updates about that in the future. Mm hmm. Okay, we've got one final story. Researchers turn LG's HomeBot vacuum cleaner into a real time spying device. I just want to know does it still clean? Because, you know, if, it, if it's still cleaning and spying, like maybe I'm all right with No, I'm just kidding. But what I don't understand is why it has a camera on it. Yeah, do they use it for like avoiding obstacles or other things? I don't know. But they showed this is what the hacker sees. And it's just a camera that appears to be at floor level. And you can see the little doggy in the corner. And you can see the baby up there. But the baby's been obscured. Um, yeah, well, this is interesting. Uh, they They have provided a fix. They disclosed the vulnerability in July, and LG responded by fixing the issues at the end of September. But who's going to update all their software? Yeah, that is a great question. That's a lot of things. And if you, unless you're already kind of security aware and you happen to be watching this program or other similar programs, how mm -hmm. are you going to know that this is even something you should prioritize? And yet, like, if you found out about it, I'm sure many would be shocked and horrified. I, I'm hoping that Alexa is being... Oh, there she goes. I'm hoping that Alexa Sorry. updates herself on a regular basis, but it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah. So, so should this be something like, uh, you know, when there's a, like an airbag defect and auto manufacturers send out a mailing to everyone, should this be a similar sort of thing where LG should be sending mail into the, the... I mean, sure, most people probably don't register these things. I don't even know if they come with no, an option to, but, you know, is that... Is there something we need here? How do we how do we get this information out if they don't auto update? Hopefully they're just auto patching and 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 you know taking care of this themselves. But clearly, well, how much faith should we have in that system if there's this vulnerability in the first place? These devices do phone home, and yeah. they do update themselves. But does everyone's device update themselves? Does everything that's on the Internet of Things update themselves? Oh, I'm positive they don't. I'm positive that a lot of them are not designed to be updated. They've just created a device and here you go, we're selling them. We haven't thought anything but the security side of upgrading them. So pick your devices carefully. Well said. And with that timely comment, that's it for today's episode of TechSnap. This has been episode 344 for November 7th, 2000. 17. Thank you very much for joining us. If you enjoyed it, head on over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. There, you can find the archive of this show, the previous incarnation, and a ton of other great content. Checked out BSD Now or uh, hey, Linux Unplugged, which is coming up later today. You can also go to the live, live page. You can join us live. They've got IRC. You can find out more about how to join there or join us on Discord. We've got a new TechSnap channel just for this here live show, so that should be a lot of fun. You can join us there. And there's, okay, one, there's the contact page, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. We mentioned that before. That's how you can send us feedback. And go check out the calendar. That'll let you know when we're here live. We're going to be doing this show at a different time, uh, Tuesday mornings, at least in the Pacific Northwest, where I happen to be. Uh, but the calendar should tell you all about that. You can find out when that's in your local time. Come join us. It's a heck of a lot of fun. You can also find us both on Twitter. I'm at Wes Payne. He's at TechSnap underscore Dan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Dan, and we'll see you all next week. Mm -hmm.